in the Philippines, there's two seasons, hot and hot and wet. And <laughs> it's, you know, it's kind of every single day is the exact same thing. Sometimes it rains, sometimes it doesn't, but they do get a ton of typhoons. They get typhoons every year. And um, there were a few times in my mission where we got hit by typhoons. I remember specifically when I was serving in Katarman, um, which is the northernmost part of the mission, and our mission president had sent out text messages to everybody letting us know that there's going to be a storm <laughs> and that it was going to be a signal three. So it was supposed to be a pretty strong storm that was blowing through, but by the time it hit land, it was nothing. And actually, I don't even think we got rain in Katarman. Like, so, you know, there was a lot of those that happened. There was probably two or three of those that occurred in my mission. Once or twice, we got hit with a signal one or a signal two typhoon. That's basically just some wind and and rain but um you know i remember i was at a leadership meeting with the mission president on a wednesday and he informed us that um typhoon yolanda or typhoon Haiyan, depending on where you're from um was heading towards our mission and that it was a signal five and that it was looking to be uh, pretty devastating so the next day we were we were actually supposed to have a um, zone conference with the mission president in Tacloban and they got cancelled because um, the mission president wanted us to prepare for the typhoon we spent Thursday um, gathering food or like supplies and rope and you know all these other things so that we could you know worst case scenario kind of things and I feel bad because you know personally um, a couple of us missionaries were kind of mocking the storm we were being insensitive to what was happening because it was a beautiful day it was you know 35 degrees Celsius out and you know there wasn't a cloud in the sky and we just thought you know what we're gonna be okay it's just gonna blow over it's gonna dissipate we're not gonna have to worry about this whatever it's no big deal I was actually a little upset that I didn't to get to go out and work on Thursday <sighs> but um, I would and have come to regret those feelings. Um, about four o'clock in the morning on Friday, we woke up to some pretty strong winds outside our window. And, you know, same thing. I kind of thought, like, whatever, it's not a big deal. There's a little wind and a little rain, no big deal. Um, talked to the office elders and you know, kind of told them we're fine and that things are okay and, you know, just kind of tried to follow up with them on how they were doing and stuff. But they actually told us that the storm is about to hit, was supposed to hit um, about 8 o'clock is when the eye was supposed to be over Tuck Loban. And so that's all the information we got before we lost signal to our cell phones and could no longer communi communicate with um with the APs and the mission president or the office others or anybody. And we kind of just waited it out and thought, no big deal. Um, and at this time, I was serving in Tacloban. I was in Samonico. And our apartment um, was actually a pretty nice place. But it had three doors that were facing the ocean and that's where the wind was coming from and we had two giant sliding doors in our basement that were just getting absolutely hammered by this wind by you know as early as 5 30 
you know, they were just getting hammered by this wind. And, and you know, we began to realize that, you know, this storm means business. And then we had a door upstairs straight above um, those sliding doors that was facing the ocean. And um, it was just getting beat on too. And we could hear it kind of like slamming and like um, trying to open up even though we had, you know, a deadbolt on it or whatever. And so we stationed, well, I guess let me back up just a second. Um, the day before we had talked to some of the missionaries within the zone and had them go stay at other apartments. So we brought a couple elders from Basai over to our apartment. So there were six missionaries in our apartment and we brought you know, the elders and sisters from Palo and from Alang Alang and, you know, from other areas into Tacloban City because we believed it would be safer. So back to our apartment. In our apartment, we set up two guys upstairs holding that door down so that it didn't come in and that water didn't get all over the place. And then we set the other four guys on the other doors downstairs. Um, and we just kind of sat there. Being downstairs, you could see the wind and just how powerful and strong it was. Uh, a couple of times we saw you know, pieces of sheet metal that people used for roofs just fly across the window, just fly past us. Um, a couple pieces got caught up in the electrical like wire on the telephone poles and stuff like that. And, you know, we really began to realize that, you know, this storm was a big deal. We could see across um, across the street onto our neighbors' houses and they were, you know, losing their roofs slowly and surely. And, you know, things just kind of, they just kept going and kept going and going. And at one point I went upstairs to kind of go check on the other elders and we noticed that our roof was beginning to um, bow and it was starting to collapse. And so we took a couple of machetes that we had had in the house. Well, a couple of missionaries took them and they began to perforate the ceiling to let it drain so that there wasn't, you know, a collapse and, you know, more damage was done. But, uh, as one of the missionaries was poking holes in the ceiling, um, his hand slipped off of the handle and he ended up cutting four of his fingers pretty deep. And, you know, he, he went to go clean it up or whatever to, you know, wrap it and bandage it. And as he set down that other, that machete, another elder went up and, um, started taking over and doing the same thing. And, it took him about 15 seconds for the handle of that machete to be too slick for him too. And he actually ended up cutting his fingers as well in the exact same place. And, you know, it was just kind of, it was kind of an absolute disaster within our own apartment. Um, what this, by this time water was really starting to come in. I think one of the windows in our house had been pulled out of its place because of the um, vacuum that was created with all the wind and you know we just kind of sat in our house held the doors back so that it wasn't too dangerous and uh, just kept on ke keeping on and once those elders had washed their hands they came back upstairs and well one of them came back upstairs and we talked to him to, for a minute about it and Actually, one of the most powerful experiences of my mission took place after that. I took hold of the door while my companion laid his hands on my on this other missionary's head and and gave him a blessing that he would be okay. And at that moment, you know, we could all feel the peace and the power of the priesthood, and we could feel how how much God loved us and how much he was watching over us. Um, within, 
Within 20 minutes or an hour, this elder's hand had basically stopped bleeding. He, you know, later we found out he had cut tendons in his fingers. That's how deep the cut was. But within only 20 minutes, because of the power of the priesthood, it had stopped bleeding. And the other elder's hand as well was, you know, more or less fine. Um, rather than losing fingers, they have limited mobility and that's it. So, you know, that for us was a miracle. I remember praying so hard during that storm that everybody would be okay, that, that we'd be able to see the mercy of God. And we truly did. The next day after the storm, we walked to the mission home, which is, you know, a 10 kilometer walk or so, maybe a little bit more than that. But we walked down there to find our mission president, the assistants and the office elders and a huge group of sisters and a couple other elders that that were definitely placed in Tuckloban for a reason. Um, the sister's apartment had flooded during the storm. There was three 20-foot waves that hit on that side of Tuckloban, and they ended up flooding the sister's, ap the sister's apartment um, in such a way that they had to... One of the sisters found a weaker spot in a wall punched her way through it, and then all of the sisters climbed out and climbed up onto the roof of their house. And they waited there for the mission president and the assistants who were extremely inspired in almost one of the worst times they could have been out in the storm. They left with rope tied around their waists, and they went and found the sisters and took them to the mission home. Um, you know, traumatized as they were, they were okay. You know, things were... Things were okay with the missionaries in the storm. Tuckloban is an extremely green and beautiful place. It's surrounded by hills and mountains and it's unbelievably beautiful. But as we walked from our apartment to the mission home, I've never seen a more barren place in my life. It was, the hills were completely brown, full of mud. All the trees had lost their leaves. Palm trees were lying on the ground, were broken in half because of the storm. Houses were destroyed, not even there anymore, washed away, lives, thousands of lives were lost. But God's presence was there. I don't doubt for a second that he was there watching over every single one of the missionaries that were serving in that area, all of the members of the church that were living in those areas, and countless numbers of just good Filipino people. God definitely loves us. And although some may argue that, you know, if he loves us so much, why would he, you know, create a typhoon like that? Why would he allow that to hit such a vulnerable people? And I don't have the answer to that question. I have fought with that question myself over the last year. And... There's really no answer to it, but I do know with my whole heart that he was there 
and that he loves us and that he was protecting us. He answered so many prayers. After the storm, we, we gathered as missionaries at the mission home, seeking refuge, you know, with our mission president. And almost instinctively, we, we had missionaries from other zones walk countless miles just to get to the mission home. I don't know how they knew or how they thought of walking to the mission home because it would be safe there, but they did. Without fail, there was, you know, so many missionaries. Every time somebody would show up, it was just cheers. It was as if we were on the other side meeting each other again. We dedicated our Sunday to service and we went out to distribute bags of food to people <laughs> that had been affected in Tuckloban. And we left pretty early in the morning. We had a small sacrament service with our mission president and as the missionaries and then we went to work and we we're handing out bags of goodies and, well, not goodies, food, and not very good food, just sardines and, you know, like top ramen noodles. But um, the gratitude on the people's faces as we were doing that was something I'll never forget. Also, the fear that I saw in the people who are waiting in line for their rations was it was haunting you know they <clears throat> such a beautiful people that I'd come to love were so scared and I was scared for them and I was scared for myself but trusting in the Lord we were there serving and we were happy about it um, we didn't pass out food for very long because it got really hot and there was a lack of water so um, missionaries started getting dehydrated and um, our mission president saw it as a threat, so he um, pulled us away from it, and we found other service work to do that day. We were packing rice for um, to give away to people the next day or whatever. But when we got home that night, after a long day of service, our mission president shared with us that um, he'd come in contact with the area presidency, and that they wanted to evacuate us as soon as possible. <clears throat> that they were going to try and do it on Monday, if not Tuesday, at the latest. So Monday was, was more of a relaxed day, I guess. You could say as relaxing as that stressful situation was. We, we weren't serving anymore because it had been too dangerous or um, impractical, I guess, at that point for us to be there. So we waited around the mission home for instruction while um, the, our mission president, the assistants, and actually my companion and myself went to try and contact other zone leaders across the mission and um, try and contact the other missionaries around the mission to help them know that we were all being evacuated to Manila and that they needed to get to either Cebu or Manila so that they could meet up with us. And, and that was, that was my day that day was just worrying about other missionaries. And, um, and I know I needed that. I know that the Lord put me in, um, that position of leadership at that time, not for me or, you know, for my own pride or because I was the best person for the job, but because he knew that the best way for me to deal with the stress of that storm was to be lost in the service of others. And that's actually a little bit of advice I'd like to give anybody who's, you know, serving the Lord 
is you're going to be under stress, so get lost in the service of others, and it'll be a lot easier. I, during those days, I felt his love, or that day I felt his love for all of his missionaries as we were able to get just enough signal on our cell phone to um, communicate a little bit with a missionary to let them know how bad it was in Tukloban and that they needed to head to Cebu. And um, by the time night had come and we had returned to the mission home, there was, you know, another 10 sets of elders and sisters at the mission home. You know, just more people had found their way to the mission home, and it was unreal to me. Um, and then Tuesday came along, and and we hiked to the mission or to the airport to try and um, get on a plane. The church had purchased tickets for us to be on a plane, but because of all the um, power outages, there was no way for them to know who had tickets and who didn't have tickets. So we got bumped off of our flight and we were stuck waiting again. And we waited at the airport from five o'clock in the morning till um, about one o'clock in the afternoon. And while we were waiting, we had um, seen a couple US soldiers and we kind of hollered at one of them and talked to him for a minute. And I really wish I could remember his name and look him up, but I just can't for the life of me. <clears throat> but as we were talking to him, he told us that he was from Hawaii and that he was a member of the church and that he'd been stationed in Mindanao for a few months now and they had been reassigned to Tukloban because of the typhoon. And it was such a tender mercy of the Lord that he was there because because I almost believe that he made it a personal mission of his own to help us to get out. He went and talked to the higher ups, his commanders, and was able to arrange with us or with them to use military aircraft to um, to evacuate us to Manila. And they had been working on doing this with some of the Filipino people, some of the more um, established people, the prominent people of, the, of Tukloban, and some of the foreigners, a lot of the U.S. people. And so at first when he came back and told us that they were allowed to evacuate us, it was only those who are foreigners were allowed to be evacuated. And, you know, it was kind of one of those... Um, the Lord's going to provide a way. We're going to be okay. We have to take this opportunity, but, you know, the Filipinos are going to be okay. And um, as we climbed into the Osprey helicopters that they used to evacuate us, um, I remember looking to the back of the, of the aircraft and seeing my mission president's wife and her children and a few more of the Filipino missionaries. And I don't know what happened in between, you know, the foreigners only and getting on that plane, but, you know, somewhere along the lines, God touched somebody's heart and, and we were all able to get out. And, you know, we went to Manila and met with the area presidency and they took phenomenal care of us for the next few days until missionaries were reassigned or, you know, some of us came home. Everything about that experience in my life just goes back to that basic idea that God is aware of us and that He loves us. And, you know, there's hundreds of personal lessons that I learned, but they're a little bit too personal. Um, after the storm, the area presidency and the mission president, they gave us um, the option, anybody who was three months or less left in their mission after the storm was not really asked to go home, but was um, that was kind of what was the plan. And um, those, my companion 
had three months left and there was only one other elder that came out with him and so they both I remember in the MTC in Manila while we were waiting to kind of figure things out again um, they were in prayer a lot trying to figure out what they were, were supposed to do I remember trying to look for my companion I was off with you know other zone leaders and the assistants and you know trying to coordinate and um, help everybody else recover so you know I would come back looking for my companion and he'd be with this other elder praying trying to decide what they should do and I think it took them three or four days to finally decide that um, what they were supposed to do was come home and so they both did and it ended up that everybody who had three months left in their missions just came home and everybody else um, well I guess there was a few missionaries that were diagnosed with um, post-traumatic stress disorder and they were given the option as well of being reassigned or coming home and a lot of them took the opportunity to come home and are doing very well right now um, on the other hand a lot of those um, elders and sisters decided to stay and some of them have come home already uh, their time has been up and um, I've seen them and they're doing fantastic so I mean a lesson from that is that God answers prayers um, he answered the prayers of those who were seeking his will in whether their missions were done or not and for those who were suffering with a mental disease that is very crippling you know God answered their prayers for has answered their prayers for the past year and you know even in myself I I have seen times where the effects of Typhoon Haiyan still you know they still affect me and they still kind of get at me but I've seen how prayer helps me to overcome that as well um, helps me to move on personally and um, you know even if it's hard a lot of the time um, a lot of the times I can find the strength I need through the Lord because I know he understands what I'm going through